Father, we thank you for your love, for your faithfulness. God, all that you give us is yours, Lord. Uh, Father, as we open your word and we see what Christ gave so that we can have this relationship that we're talking with you right now, God, Lord. Let it permeate our soul. Let us, let us be so thankful, God, as we praise you this morning for all that you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 26, 36. <clears throat> then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. <clears throat> Remember, Jesus had just finished his final Passover meal that we call the Last Supper. And now Jesus and his 11 disciples crossed over the brook Kidron over to a place called the Mount of Olives. And there Jesus often went in, with his disciples into a garden there known as Gethsemane. John's account actually says this in 18.1. He went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, and there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. Why? For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So John indicates that the Garden of Gethsemane is one of the famous hangout places that they would just go and just rest with his friends, the disciples. But Judas also knew of this place. We need to remember that at the Last Supper, Satan had entered Judas and then left the mill right before Jesus introduced the new covenant that was going to be made possible through his blood. So on the night of betrayal, Judas probably knew exactly where Jesus would be. Now to look at some pictures here of the topography of the garden here, as we talked about. Here is the Temple Mount. Here is the Mount of Olives here. Um, here is Bethany, where, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus come. He stay there often. But Right now, he actually leaves the temple, leaves the upper room, goes out, crosses uh, the Kirtan Valley. There may be a bridge to cross at that time. We're not too sure. To a place called Gethsemane. For, so from Gethsemane, you can actually look and see the Temple Mount. It's a beautiful location. And it was there, and what would happen is this garden area was heavily wooden with olive groves. So look at some next couple pictures. Here, you are in this olive grove, and you see what you see? That's the what? The Temple Mount, that's got the Dome of the Rock on it right now. But you can see from this olive grove, I have a couple more pictures, I think, there. Beautiful, very old, old olive groves there. And I think I got one more there. Now, the word Gethsemane is two words. Gat and Shemanin means a place for pressing, and this means oil. So Gethsemane literally means what? An oil press is what it actually means. Um, and so during Jesus' times... Olives were actually harvested. A lot of them were the, were the purple olives, and they were placed in a crutch, uh, crusher. You see this little um, uh, uh, trench that was there? You'd have a donkey, and he'd be attached to a piece of wood, and he would walk around and around and around. And as he walked around, this heavy-duty uh, uh, rock would then go crush all the different olives that you can So you put the olives in there, and the donkey would go down and then crush them. Another one. So here are some of the olives, uh, a lot of the pur uh, purple. They were placed in this before they would go around. In the next slide, we show that it would go around and it would actually make it into kind of a, a mash, a mulch that would actually be then taken at this point. Now what would happen is they would take these, and next slide, they would grab them and they would put them into these baskets. So one basket would be filled with this, this um, mulch of, of crushed olives, and another one would be placed on top, and another one would be placed on top, and another one would be placed on top, and they would put it with a rock here or some kind of a pressure on a log, and look at the next slide. And then what they would do is they would put heavy weights here, and in doing that, it would start pushing more and more and more and more and more, and the olives would start to drip the olive oil that would then go and be collected into a trough and then put into bottles. Next slide. And here's what actually was happening. And the olives would actually be pressed. They'd actually roll down. Now, the first pressing they would do is actually called the extra virgin oil. If you've heard the different types of olive oil, and that's the extra virgin with the first press as each um, uh, 
consecutive pressing would go, they would then change the, the term of it. And so, too, there you need to realize, next slide, that there the Son of God is going to be crushed also. There the Son of God is going to be pressed there, knowing that the sins of the world and the wrath of God is going to be placed on them. And it's such a great picture and metaphor of exactly what Jesus is going to go there as he's praying in the garden prior to his crucifixion, which is about 15 hours away. And so you go back to <clears throat> Matthew 26, 36. Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. He asked his 11 disciples to sit in one location, but he's going to go to another location to pray. And he took with him, verse 37, Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's Peter, James, and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Check those words out. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He takes Peter and James and John. Peter and James and John were with him where? At the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were with him when? When Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. And now he takes his three closest buddies with him, and he takes them to this place here, and he's saying, I'm going through a tough time. My heart is so sorrowful. Now, Jesus knew what was going to happen in the next 15, 15 hours. In fact, God's word made it very clear. He knew that prophecy of Isaiah 53 and other prophecies had to be fulfilled. So he's not caught off guard. Isaiah 53 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, what? The iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Now that was written by Isaiah. Jesus knew that he was going to be wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. Stripes would be laid upon his back. He would be smitten with a rod. They would mock him, scorn him, oppress him, spit upon him. And they knew that the Lord was going to lay upon him the iniquity of you and I as our sins are placed upon him at the cross. He knew he was going to stand in the place of a guilty sinner and receive the spiritual punishment that sinful man that you and I received. So you see, that was his mission. As 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he who knew no sin would be sin for us. Now, What's hard for us to imagine, because we're sinful people, is that Jesus was a sinless man. He was a holy man. And yet, he's got to realize that sin's going to be placed upon him, let alone God's judgment for that sin will be placed upon him. And he was deeply grieved to the point of death because of having to become sin. And, he, and therefore, he, he tells his friends, Peter, James, and John, in verse 38, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death, stay here and watch with me. Exceedingly sorrowful means encompassed with grief. It is possible to die from sorrow and from grief just as much as any emotion like fright and anger. I was doing some research because I was looking at this when, when he said, even unto death. I thought, well, what, what is he saying, even unto death, that he could die? There is a syndrome called the broken heart syndrome. It's also known as stress cardiomyopathy, or Tukatsubo syndrome. It occurs when a person experiences sudden acute stress that can rapidly weaken the heart muscle. And according to John Hopkins Medicine and Mayo Clinic, can be fatal, about 1%. Now, we talk about distress that we actually take. But we have no idea... And Jesus knew exactly the, what he was going to go through. And it's not just the death. He knew he was going to rise from the dead. 
It's the fact that your sin and my sin was going to be placed upon him, and the wrath of God is going to come upon him. He knows the suffering he would receive. And that anguish and that distress and that grief was enough to kill a person. But God had other plans for death than this. When someone is also under extreme physical and emotional stress, it's possible for capillary networks around in your sweat glands to rupture, allowing blood to enter into the sweat glands. It's a medical condition known as hematohydrosis. Literally, your capillaries break and they mix with your sweat glands and you drip blood. Luke, Dr. Luke, in his account, chapter 22, 44, wrote of this, and being in, angry, in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like what? Great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Like that heavy slab of rock that we saw in Gethsemane pressing down on the olive baskets, right? Having that olive oil dripping out, the weight of knowing that the sin of the world would come upon him made his capillaries break and great drops of blood falling to the ground. So what do you do when you are in a difficult situation, guys, when you are overwhelmed, when you are emotionally distraught or distressed? Not just stressed, but distressed. It's unhealthy. I like the first thing that Jesus did was he asked his friends, Peter, James, and John, his closest buddies, to be with him and to pray for him. He said to them, stay here and watch with me. He wanted their support. And we see great wisdom here in giving him the, the, this request. We will let readers see that he will kind of repeat this differently in verse 41 when he says, watch, ye pray, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. See, Jesus is about to enter a fierce spiritual battle, but his friends seem to be somewhat clueless of what's really happening, and so Jesus exhorts them, watch and pray in verse 41. Well, what does it mean to watch? Watch means to be aware of Satan's craftiness and spiritual attack. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the what? The wiles, the trickeries of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. So watch. Be aware that we're in a spiritual warfare, guys. And secondly, pray for strength, both physically and spiritually, not just when you're under attack, but anticipation of coming attack and coming temptation. Sometimes, you know, you're walking into a difficult time, and you know you're going to walk into a lot of temptations. We got a lot of holidays coming up, and sometimes things are right there that are difficult for us to go to. Pray, pray, pray. And that's what he's asking his friends to do, and I think it's great that we also ask our friends also. We need to be watching and praying for other people. The second thing that we see Jesus did <clears throat> was he fell on his face in prayer. <clears throat> Matthew 26, 39 says, he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed. So Jesus is doing just what he asked what? His friends to do. He's coming to the Lord in prayer just as he asked his friends to come to the Lord in prayer. If Jesus, if Jesus in his greatest time of need realizes that he needs to go to the Father in total humility on his face, in honesty as we're going to see, and surrender that we will read about, so should we. You see, we read in verse 39, what was his prayer? O oh, Father, if it is possible, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, <clears throat> not as I will, but as you will. Jesus speaks of a cup. It's a metaphor of the sufferings and death that he will face as he takes on the, the punishment for our sins. In the Old Testament, in several places, but I'm going to refer to one, God's wrath and judgment are often pictured as a cup to be drank. Isaiah 51, 17 is a great example. Awake, awake. Stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the cup of the Lord 
at the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury. You have drank the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. This is why Jesus' soul is so exceedingly sorrowful and so deeply distressed. This cup symbolizes the suffering that he would endure on the cross. The cup of God's fury vented against all the sins of mankind. And the Son himself, Jesus Christ, would take them upon him as a sacrificial lamb of God. This is an incredible spiritual battle going on here. And Satan's there. And Jesus is wrestling this this unseen foe in prayer with his father. See, there's a battle going on. It's the battle of the wheels. My will versus what? God's will. That's the battle, guys, that we face all the time. The agony of becoming sin was becoming unbearable for the sinless Son of God. And he's wondering out loud before the Father if there could be another way for man to be delivered from sin. Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Father, If there's any other way that the sins of the world could be paid for, rather than me having the drink of the cup of your wrath and taking the wrath of everybody upon me, Father, that's what I'd rather see happen. If it's possible, then let this cup pass. And Jesus is coming to a point, a point of decision here in Gethsemane. And it's important to realize, Jesus' victory on the cross is dependent about what happens to him on his knees and on his face. Our victory of what we choose to do is always first fought where? In the prayer closet, in the prayer room. And when we get victory in the prayer room, that's when we get victory out there in the world, guys. And real battles are fought in the prayer closet, guys, not on battlefields. His success here would make the victory at the cross possible. See, we read, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And there... Guys, he's fighting a battle, a battle of wills. I don't want to have to go through this. If there's any other possible way, way, Father, let's do this. But God, my will is not what I truly want. What I want is what? Your will. It's this conscious decision that he's making of being honest with the Lord. Like I said, he's being honest with the Lord where he's at. But he's also surrendering up his will to do what? The will of the Father. That's so important, guys, for each one of us. As long as you are fighting the will of God in your life, then you're destined for defeat. It's kind of a self-contradictory paradox, right? I'm fighting. The only way to, to, to win is to what? Surrender? That's exactly right. The way to victory is by surrendering, by giving up your will to his will. And when you give up your will to God's will, that's when you're going to be victorious. you got to realize God wants nothing but the best for your life. And you go, well, was that the best for Jesus' life? To die on the cross, to take our sins? In the big picture, that's why he came. He came that we can have a relationship. And the big picture, as we read this, the big picture was happening. The answer is yes, to do the Father's will was the best thing for Jesus to do. Many times we, we hear people in the world, I hear people in the world say, Father, we know all things are possible with you. Lord, we we pray that you would heal this person. I believe that when somebody is sick and they come to the elders, we should anoint them with oil, we should lay hands on them, and we should pray the prayer of what? Faith. Asking God to do that. That is scriptural. That is right to do. But I also know that God doesn't always heal. I also know that God has a different reason and purpose, just like we talked about last week with the thorn in the flesh, right? Paul prayed how many times? Three times. And the answer was, my grace is sufficient. See, a lot of times that's the answer to it is. Are you going to submit yourself to the the will of God? There are people that are going declaring that you should demand things from God. Name it and claim it. Blab it and grab it. Insist on it. Make your confessions. And God has to acquiesce to your will. These people have no understanding of God, no understanding of his nature, nor even what a relationship with God is. It takes greater faith, a far greater faith, to submit yourself to God totally, commit your life totally to God, than it does a selfishly insistent demand that God do something for you. It takes greater faith. Because I'm not going to say, I want this God, I want this God, I need this God, than to say, Lord, 
Faith is believing that God's on the throne. He sees the big picture, and he's going to do what's best in the big picture for all. That's faith. That's faith. Jesus expresses his will, and that's fine. You and I express our will, right, to God. We need to be open with God. He's honest with the Father. And, Lord, if this is what I would like, but then, you know, guys, I have learned that I ultimately want, even though I might be praying for a sick child, I might be praying for, for finances, I might be praying for whatever it is, it is wise to close your prayer with what? But Lord, not my will, but what? Thy will. That's what I want. We must surrender every part of our lives to the Lord. Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father, which means that he was willing now to take the cross. I want you to catch that. Because he was now willing to submit to the will of the Father, he was now ready to lay down his life and literally, what, pick up the cross. But that battle, that battle was fought first in the prayer closet. It shows how much the Father loves you. It shows you how much Jesus loves you. Earlier in Matthew 16, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Kind of interesting, because Jesus now is literally going to what? Deny himself what he wants, and literally what? Pick up the cross. That's what Jesus did. Not my will, but what? Thy will, actually. And that's what he's doing right here. That means that you and I must deny our self-will, our selfishness, and totally submit to the will of the Heavenly Father. Whatever that looks like, whatever that is. And that will be picking up the cross, however that means in your life. True prayer is yielding to what God wants for us, regardless of the cost, even the cost of death. So when I pray, I make the reservation, but Lord, you know all things. Your ways are not our ways. Your thoughts are not our thoughts. So Father, I pray that your will be done. Let me give grace to receive that, Lord, whatever that looks like. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as your will. If it is possible, the reality is that there was no other way. Salvation by the work of Jesus on the cross, Jesus paying for the debt of your sin is the only possible way for the sins of the world to be taken away. John the Baptist saw Jesus and what he said, Behold the Lamb of God who what? takes away the sins of the world. And that's what the cross of Christ declares. And that's what he declared to every single person. That is the only way through the cross that a person can be saved. Because if there would have been another possible way, the Father would have granted it to the Son. As Jesus is praying for the will. But there is no other way. If there would have been another way, let's say by being good or by being moral or following a creed or following a law, then God would have done that because there would have been another possible way. But there was no possible way that we can be forgiven except through the cross. The new covenant that Jesus just talked about a few hours before at the Last Supper that was established is the only way through his blood. The cross is essential for salvation, and that is why the cross is offensive. Because the cross says there's no other way by which a man shall be saved, and people don't want to hear that. They want to think there's something they can do or be a good person. They have this perception that God's up there and he's got this little scale. And if I do good things and help so many old ladies across the street, then it will balance out all the bad things I did. And God, that's not, that's not the picture of God in the Bible. The wages of sin is what? Death. Death. That's it. And the only way that we can be saved is through the cross. That's it. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes through the Father except what? Through me. So Matthew 26, 40, we see the battle's not over yet because then he came to his disciples and he found them asleep. And he says to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, I get the human physiology of it. 
I got a leg of lamb in my tummy. It's about midnight. Just took a short little brisk walk, went over to the garden. I'm a little tired. I'm a lot tired. It's been a full day hanging out with Jesus. This has been quite a week since he came down a few days before, right? Sunday on the triumphant entry. I'm exhausted. I get that. But he specifically asked his three closest friends to stay here and watch with me. <clears throat> An hour earlier, they already, all of them promised to be faithful unto what? Death. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I'm with you. And then it said, and so said all of them. They were all ready to die for him, but they couldn't stay awake for him. They're oblivious truly to the agony and the need of their Lord. It would have been, I'm sure, meant so much to the Lord if they had watched and prayed with him. He loved these guys. And it's true that no one can disappoint and hurt us as much as someone that we love so dearly. Somebody can say whatever they want about me and it doesn't really matter, but somebody who I care about and love about, they share something that would really hurt. I need this from you. They're not there. That would hurt a lot. Now, Jesus was not surprised. He was omniscient. He was perfectly aware of their weakness. He even predicted a few hours ago that very night that they would even result in desertion. But it doesn't mean in this last hours he still wasn't sad and disappointed. But <clears throat> he says to Peter, could you not watch with me for one hour? But then he kind of encouraged them. Okay, guys, round two. 41, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The word watch is actually <clears throat> present imperative. In other words, it means I want you to watch and then what? Keep watching. I want you to pray and what? Keep praying, all right? I don't want you to do, you got to realize this. I want you to stay awake, stay alert, don't stop. And that's why we need to realize the need for spiritual vigilance is not occasionally, but what? Constant. To pray and then to keep praying. To watch, to look for attack, and to keep watching. Why, verse 41 continues, because the spirit is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. Jesus acknowledged many times that doing the right thing is difficult. Our spirit is willing, but our flesh is still weak. Last week, the whole study was on a warning against self-assurance. Peter, I know your spirit's right. I know that you're sincere. I, I, I know that you're devoted to me. I, I understand that. I know that you love me. But Peter, the problem isn't with your spirit. The problem is with your what? Your flesh. The problem is if you rely upon your flesh, you're going to fail, Peter. Do you get that? That's where the problem is with you and I also. I want to serve the Lord with everything that I have. But the problem is I'm living in a body of flesh that is weak. <clears throat> and it's important for us to know that us weak and do not trust in it. And as we talked about last week, many times God wants to reveal to us just how weak we are in the flesh so that we learn to what? Rely upon him. That's the reason. That we give up when we say, Lord, then you do the work, what? In me and through me, as we shared last week, because I know I can do all things through what? Christ, who strengthens me. And that's where we need to live. Watch and pray for the lure of temptation, he's asking them. Their desire to need for the flesh and sleep was pretty hard. The flesh, I know you guys want to tie your tired. You want to fall asleep, but I'm asking you not to. Is it possible that Satan was there actually luring them to sleep? Was that the temptation that was happening? All I know is there's times when I'm lying down in bed and I open my Bible or I turn the recording on to listen to the words. I go fast asleep. I want to do it. I try to do it. And all of a sudden, it's just, I'm just, I just can't keep my eyes open. Satan doesn't want you to read his word. Satan doesn't want you to listen to the, your, your Bible reading. He doesn't want that to happen. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Peter, like you and I, we see failed in temptation because he failed to watch and pray. I think that's what Peter is being taught here. A very big lesson to watch and pray. You see, when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and others there at Pentecost, he started walking in the Spirit, and he started understanding things. And I'm sure his mind went to this time where he let 
the Lord down where he didn't watch in prayer. Because the same Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now that's a different Peter. That's one who's learned from his mistakes. I got to be careful of what's going to happen here. And verse 42, we read, and a second time Jesus now went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass from me unless I drink it, your will be done. He goes to prayer a second time on his knees, the exact same prayer. And I think this is really good for us to understand that there's times that we need to labor in prayer over and over. And we don't need to go to prayer over and over as a means to bend God's wills to our selfish will. Jesus is going over and over with a desire to bend his will to what? The Father's will. That's where the battle is. He recognizes that. And he goes to the Father. Lord, I I want to align my life with your life. I want to align my will with your will, Lord. But I'm struggling here in this area. You don't understand my husband. You don't understand my boss. You don't understand the finances. You don't understand our communication problems. You don't understand. God understands. God understands. He sees it all. But he's wanting you to understand that he wants, you want to want his will and his desires in your life. So Jesus previously waking up his friends, he exhorts his free friends. It says in verse 41 to watch him pray. But what happens? Verse 43 He came again and he found them asleep, for their eyes were heavy. He checks on his three friends and they are asleep. Now, I'm not too sure if they didn't understand the needs of Christ. I don't think they truly understood the magnitude of what he was going through. How could you understand the magnitude of what your Lord is going to go through? But we know clearly that the flesh had its needs and the flesh was very weak. And so he leaves them without waking them up. We read in Luke that while his disciples failed to support Jesus in his hour of need to keep watching and praying, God the Father sent his Son a special support from heaven itself to help Jesus in the special hour of need. Luke twenty two forty three 43 says that an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. Isn't that amazing? God's capable of intervening and doing wonderful things in our lives and encouraging us. Verse 44 so then he left them, went, again, went, went away again, and prayed a third time, saying the same words. Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. The same things with a resolve to do the Father's will. Now, while it doesn't indicate specifically It seems possible that there may have been three different spiritual attacks coming upon the Lord. We've seen that happen in the wilderness, right? There were three spiritual attacks that came upon Jesus Christ from Satan in the wilderness. So that could be after the third time of supplication, Jesus was the victor and Satan was vanquished there in the wilderness. The same thing happened here. He remains in harmony to do the will of the Father. See, it was there in Gethsemane in prayer that Jesus overcame the enemy, and it was there in Gethsemane that he became the victor at the cross. It's one there on his knees. And we read, Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. (laughs) He wakes them up. Here, are you guys still sleeping and resting? Get up, guys. My time has come. My hour is at hand. Now, that's important because there were many times <clears throat> when the chief priests and these religious lures wanted to get Jesus, right? When John 7.30 says, Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. John 8.20, these words Jesus spoke in the treasury right there in Jerusalem as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. But now Jesus said, my hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Verse 46, he says, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is also what? 
at hand. The word at hand is come nigh. Jesus knew that Judas and those would soon arrest him. They were on their way. Maybe they heard them coming up the pathway to the garden. You've got to realize it's around midnight, making their way from the house of Caiaphas. This is now the beginning of the end or the end of a brand new beginning. Depending on how you look at it, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace. We thank you, Father, for sending your son, Jesus. And as you said, Jesus, no one takes my life, but I lay down my life. Father, we thank you for, for your son. If there's anyone here who's never said, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I, I, God, I need you to be the Lord of my life. I want to receive Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life and be your Savior. Lift up your hand. If you're watching online, say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior. That's why he came, that you might have a relationship with the Father. That there might be people here who've walked in this morning who might be struggling with my will versus God's will. You're having a battle right now, and you know you want God's will, but you want us as a body to pray for you to want God's will to lend it. That's you. Lift up your hand this morning. Thank you, guys. You see the battle? Father, we thank you. Let's pray. Father, we pray for our brothers. We watch with our brothers. We pray for our brothers and sisters. Lord, help them, Father. Thank you. They desire to want your will, Father. Help them to do your will, to trust you. Increase their faith, Father. And Lord, give them the the, the desire and obedience, as Jesus now did, to follow through. The victory is won here, Lord. And we pray for victory in our lives in Jesus Christ. And they all said, God bless you guys. Have a great day.